Hi, I'm Dr. Giovanni Rondo, host of Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit, where we discuss improving the health of our entire world with a particular focus on the local African-American community right here. Today's topic is a pretty difficult topic that not a lot of people like to talk about, um, but it's one that is obvious um, in our whole society, in our whole world, and that is racism in the medical field, <clears throat> excuse me, or racism in medicine and how this actually affects the health and the wellness of our entire world. So here goes. This is a topic that um, it really doesn't seem like it fits into the pristine and elevated profession that is um, the medical field. But it's definitely relevant to exactly what's going on today, not only with the pandemic that we're facing, but the racial uh, protests that we see um, and the healthcare disparities that have really been highlighted um, in so many ways. My belief is that you can't fix a problem that you won't face. And so we need to face uh, this problem so that not necessarily that we can fix it, but so that we can at least start the process of healing, healing our world, healing our community. So as I talk about this particular topic, I'm gonna to talk about the definition of racism in the medical field. We're gonna talk about the relevance of this topic, of course. We're gonna talk a little bit of statistics, the history, what's going on now in 2021. And then the majority of the time, I'd like to talk about solutions, what we can do to help. Now, I'm not gonna act like what I'm gonna say is completely exhaustive. Um, it, it's just basically what I have read in terms of my research and um, what I found in terms of some of my life experiences, not only as a physician, um, but as an African-American woman. So let's go ahead and get started. So the definition of racism in the medical field is the systemic and widespread devaluing and discrimination of persons of color, particularly black people who are descendants of American slaves in healthcare spaces. It's relevant, uh, has really been highlighted with the Centers for Disease Control, also called the CDC, has noted that racism is a public health issue. Historically, uh, racism in the medical field has its very foundations in the slave, uh, transatlantic, a uh, slave trade, perpetuated through slavery over 200 years, continued on with Jim Crow uh, laws, um, the lynchings that have occurred. It's been seen in the civil rights movement and the need for that, redlining, um, and even seen in police brutality and the uh, issues with the war on drugs which actually has, has been a war on the African-American family. And just recently, the American Medical Association Journal podcast highlighted uh, this discrepancy of even the belief that racism in the medical field exists when two Caucasian male physicians said that there's no way that racism can exist because there's, there's no such thing as a racist physician. But um, a lot of us beg to differ. And with that whole uh, issue, those physicians um, were reprimanded, they were fired, and an apology was given. But I think they speak to um, just the disbelief and just a sense of this doesn't occur. And I believe that as we talk more about it, and as we not just talk about it, but we invite our other partners who are uh, of other races to discuss the issue, I think that it will be better uh, dealt with in the long run.
because again, we can't fix a problem that we won't face. So just going over a few just very basic statistics, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of. The prevalence of disease uh, and also a higher rate of deaths occur specifically in our community, in the African-American community. We live shorter lives, particularly African-American males. The rates for high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, infant mortality, maternal or mother mortality, the rates of violence are all higher in our communities. In addition to kidney disease and other uh, medical issues. We see with this pandemic higher rates of COVID-19 in our population and higher rates of death due to COVID-19 in our population. Not to mention different cancers that also occur. There are even studies that show that because of structural racism, there's higher levels of psychosis and mental illness in the African-American community. Now, like I mentioned before, um, some of these statistics are um, specific to our community, of course, but it's in no way exhaustive. So I'm just talking about the tip of the iceberg when it comes to racism in the medical field. When the transatlantic slave trade concept was even thought about when it came to Africans, um, they were thought to be particularly appropriate for laborious tasks, um, felt less pain, and could work in conditions like chattel. So procuring and stealing um, Africans as a means to fulfill the, the conquering of land like the United States was done uh, just, uh, and it was justified. During the transatlantic route, Africans were brought on ships in subhuman conditions, chained together um, like sardines without adequate nutrition or hydration and endured the, and the ones who endured that treacherous uh, voyage um, were then in even more so uh, subhuman conditions, working uh, the land from sun up to sundown, basically. No medical treatment, basic, for the most part, medical treatment was not uh, adequate or appropriate. And many of them, of course, died not only on the, the transatlantic uh, slave trade, but during uh, slavery or had very short lifespans. So this system was perpetuated for many years, hundreds of years. Uh, the story of Harriet Tubman rings uh, with heroism, but she is a prime example of what um, occurred uh, during slavery. She actually was hit in the head with a, uh, a large weight never received adequate attention, medical attention, and suffered from narcolepsy, migraines, and also seizures for the rest of her life. Now, after slavery ended, I also uh, mentioned uh, talking about the lynchings that occurred and Jim Crow um, uh, laws that were instituted and the rise of the KKK, groups like the KKK. All of these things affected the medical health, health of African Americans in the United States. During slavery, there were numerous experiments that took place with slave women and also men. We um, also think of the, the trauma of lynchings and we think of how people watching those lynchings were affected. Lynchings were used to actually, as a scare tactic, of course. Um, so just the people who survived those things 
would definitely have been traumatized for life and potentially pass that on to their own children. Now, even after slavery was, had ended, um, lynching still occurred. Um, there were conditions like, or uh, um, whole concepts like having appendectomies in the Mississippi area where people were told that they were getting their appendix removed or sometimes other organs, uh, their tonsils removed, but they were actually getting, or they, they were women that they were having their uh, uteruses removed, which did not allow them to actually have children. And we all know about the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, which in the uh, 1930s, started in the 1930s, the government actively watched um, large groups of African-American males who had families who had syphilis or were actually um, uh, not treated for the syphilis that they had. And they were able to continue to um, spread that and suffer the effects of untreated syphilis throughout their lives. There's also the concept of the HeLa cells. And HeLa uh, stands for Henrietta Lacks. And she was a poor uh, woman, I believe, that lived in actually the somewhere around the, the, the Baltimore area. And she had ovarian cancer. And her cells were used to just um, do so many different experiments and they have been used um, in so many ways, but without her permission, without her family's permission, and there has been literally billions and maybe even trillions of dollars that has been made um, on her cells to make other things like vaccines, um, to come up with other drugs and medications all on one woman's cells. There's also the eradication of black hospitals, medical schools, right here in the state of Kentucky, in the city of Louisville, there was an African American hospital and also a medical school that was shut down. So these are just uh, some of the examples um, and what has actually been documented. But as you know, there's plenty of other instances that has not been documented and are just unknown. So we're just at the tip of the iceberg. Coming up to today in 2021, we are in a worldwide pandemic which has affected us tremendously. Uh, we are also seeing racial protests, police brutality with the killings of both George, modern day lynching of George Floyd and the killing of Breonna Taylor right here in the city of Louisville. And then just the trauma of watching the lynchings um, or, or hearing about them over and over and over again um, is traumatizing in and of itself. Then there's the examples of blatant racism that occur in the hospital. There is a, was a physician by the name of Dr. Susan Moore, an African-American uh, physician in the state of Indiana who was denied adequate medical attention. And she documented her plight on Facebook and she ended up passing away just within a couple of days of her documenting her plight of how she was uh, poorly treated in the hospital. So there's so many different um, things that we could sit and talk about um, when it comes to racism in the medical field. And we're just, like I said, touching the surface of it. There's so many things that I could kind of talk about too, but one of the things that I really want to focus on today is not just talking about uh, the issues, but talking about solutions. And what I have um, kind of determined that there's certain things that we need to to do to, to not completely get rid of racism, that would be great, but at least trying to get it out of our systems as much as we possibly can. 
and they all start with the, the letter F. So the first thing that we're going to do, it's seven different uh, solutions or things that we can do to help decrease or to help eradicate uh, or improve our experiences as African Americans in this, in this world, uh, but particularly decreasing racism in the medical field. The first thing that we've actually, that I've actually been saying is we have to face the problem. We can't fix a problem that we won't face. And even though this is a very difficult topic, it's extremely important for us to face it, to talk about it, to bring it out, and to also have our allies who are, who may not be comfortable, and we may, may not be comfortable either, but again, we need to talk about the issues. We need to be able to speak about how we are treated, how African Americans are devalued and dehumanized in so many different uh, aspects. So the next um, thing besides beyond facing um, this problem is forgetting the they's. A lot of times we talk about they did this and they did that. Um, so we have to kind of get the they's out of our minds and remember who we are as a people and to know who we are and to remember whose we are, most importantly, that we are, all of us, are children of the Most High and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So, and as a group, as African Americans, we need to remember the strength that, and the resilience and the legacy that our forefathers and foremothers have left us. So I bring up, again, Harriet Tubman. And there's so many different people just overall. But Harriet Tubman is just, I, I think, one of the um, heroines of our people, of course. And with Harriet Tubman, she has just done so many different things, not just as the Moses and, and, and as the, the, the conductor for the Underground Railroad, but she has also served as a spy, a Civil War hero, uh, a nurse. So she is someone that we can look to, to kind of say, okay, if she's able to undergo these horrible circumstances, we can too in this day and age in 2021. And that goes on to the next point. The next F is find. Find out about your own history, your own family, and our people. Now, in the medical field, one of the things, or me as a physician, one of the things that I uh, delve into is people's personal history and their family history. So know your history. So because we have a higher uh, incidences of high blood pressure, diabetes, all these uh, issues and illnesses, we need to know who has it in our family. We need to know our parents' history, grandparents' history, and as many people as we possibly can. Because that gives us a better idea of what's going on in our own bodies. Um, genetically, some diseases are passed down. And so it's very important for us to know those things. And so not just high blood pressure and diabetes, but also mental uh, issues, also pulmonary issues, lung issues, just all different types of things. So that's very, very important. The next F is figure out um, how to be and how to support others in advocacy. And advocacy is so vitally important to helping us through so many different things. Being an advocate for other people can actually help them through the process. So the example that I like to give is how when you go to the doctor or you are um, in the hospital, having another set of eyes or having another set of, of, of ears helps. And so that can help you to understand what the doctor's saying, what they're not saying, what kind of medications you're taking or not. Um, and so that's very, very important. And this can help you and help others to tread through the medical establishment. 
So when you find that someone has been offensive or doing something that is not appropriate, having that other set of ears and eyes or just someone who can advocate for you is vitally important. The next F is to forage. Forage for your own health. And I know foraging means you know going out and, and, and finding. But that's exactly what we need to do. Forage for your own health. <laughs> There's only so much that doctors and, and hospitals or whatnot can do. Most health does not occur in a hospital. Most of it does not occur in an emergency room or, in ev or even in a doctor's office. It occurs at home. It occurs doing the little things that are so important to your overall life, the things that you eat, how much exercise you get, how you deal with stress, how much sleep you get, the things that you consume, not just what you eat, but the things that are going into your head. So all those things are vitally important and finding a, the, the most optimal um, foods, exercise routines, just, you know, those things are very, very important. And it's up to each individual to do those types of things. Um, the doctors can only do so much for you. The next F is fun or fund. Fun because it's important for us to have fun in this whole life and in our, in our journeys. And I know I just said that, uh, you know, watch what you're eating and drinking and all that, that kind of stuff, but you can still have fun in that. You can still be physically active and have fun but also fund. And in terms of trying to dismantle racism in our society, we have got to have the funds to do so. And in that, it, it takes thinking outside of the box. It takes um, considering alternatives that may not have been considered. So we want to fund our health overall in our communities being able to have doctor's offices being able to have hospitals being able to have healthcare facilities that are focused on providing optimal health is vitally important so some of the ideas that i had particularly in our community is and, and this was before some of the the other buildings went up but right there at 18th and broadway I thought that would have been a great location for the VA hospital. I know that there's some other buildings going up there, but what a great, um, basically, cornerstone that would help the economics of the community. It would help in the health of our community, physical health, mental health, and in so many other ways. So thinking outside the box is, is, is important. Also considering bringing other institutions in our communities um, to help with the economics. And economics is very important um, for our overall health. We also need to focus on environmental uh, uh, health because living in an area that has a lot of um, buildings, um, not a lot of green spaces. It, the air quality does not tend to be as optimal. And that's just one uh, issue when it comes to just environmental um, um, justice, I, I guess I should say. So all those things are, are, are important. Also the policies. Um, when we deal with the policies that continue to perpetuate racism and perpetuate uh, devaluing our lives. We need to have people who represent us and represent our causes and our needs on so many different levels. And then the last F is faith. Having faith over fears. Just looking at what our people have done what God has done for us. 
and just know that we have can and will do so much by the grace of God. And we have a wonderful blueprint of what our forefathers and foremothers have done in the past. They have gone through a tremendous amount. So I go back to uh, Harriet Tubman again. And sometimes it, it, it seems like, again, you know, she's done so much, but she really doesn't get credit for um, a lot of the things that, that, um, that she has, has been able to do. And one of the things that I was reading about recently was how Harriet Tubman actually came up with a treatment for dysentery. And dysentery is basically diarrhea, and we don't deal with that anymore because of the advancements of, of, for our society. But years ago and back in the 1800s, lots of people died of dysentery. Lots of Civil War, uh, uh, lots of people within the Civil War actually were dying of dysentery. Well, Harriet Tubman, as a nurse, was able to come up with a concoction of natural remedies that she had found from her childhood and was able to actually administer these remedies to help decrease dysentery with the Civil War, some of the Civil War uh, participants. And so that's a, a little, I guess, little known black history fact. So as a nurse, she was able to help in so many ways. As a uh, Underground Railroad conductor, she helped in that way. But also, in 1908, Harriet Tubman actually founded a home for the infirm. Now, Harriet Tubman was born in about 100, I'm sorry, about 200 years ago in 1821. So she founded this house uh, for the infirm to help with others, just basically like a nursing facility or a nursing home. She was 80 seven years old. So she was never um, complacent. She did things throughout all of her life. And so um, that actually should give all of us uh, reasons to not only feel proud of what she did, but also have a sense of inspiration that no matter our status in life, no matter um, our race, no matter our economic status, no matter our age, that we can all play a role in making our world better. And one of the things that Harriet Tubman was known to, to say was, never ask permission to save our own lives. So facing the problem, finding out who you are, figuring out how to be an advocate, also foraging for your own health and doing what's, what's important. And funding this whole concept is vitally important for us to end racism in the medical field. And the most important one is having faith over fears. Thank you. And it's truth, justice, power. It's TV our way.